Welcome to our newsroom in Tortoise. Um, I'm James Harding. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Tortoise alongside my fellow co-founder, Katie Fanick smith who's here. Um, for a number of people, this will be their first visit to our newsroom. For some people, it will be a return. Thanks for coming back. As you'll see, we are very gingerly returning to what used to be known as real life people coming into our newsroom and talking. We, we're trying to do this in such a way that we keep people relatively sp spread out so that they're not worried about being too close to each other. So I hope that you feel comfortable. But what we've really missed is what we actually set up Tortoise to do, which was to open our newsroom to people come in and, and be able to hear from people what they think. So the idea of a thinking was really simply to hold a news meeting where we would have a discussion, better still probably an argument, that got to a better understanding of what's happening in the world. And so the idea was that it would be a forum for civilized disagreement, but a system of organized listening, by which I mean you'd try in the course of an hour to go through a set of issues. And the reason I say that in the context of this particular conversation is we definitely want to go there. If we haven't had the argument by the end of the hour, if we haven't really listened to it, we'll have probably fallen short. And the reason that I say that, uh, and, and I see that Julie Smile and Nikki probably have a sense of it too, is we'd be pretending if the issues that are at the heart of your book, Julie, don't divide our own newsroom. Right? So I don't mean just our members of Tortoise, but but generationally, some of the issues that are at the heart of Julie's book really divide us. And they might well be irreconcilable. In fact, possibly that's one of the conclusions we'll come to. But that's what we want to do in the course of this conversation. And we're trying to make sure that we learn one of the great lessons of this past long, long year is that not everyone who's got something interesting to say happens to be in central London. And so what we're hoping is that we really can marry what happened to us in the pandemic, which is being able to get access to people all over the country, in fact, all over the world. And so I really will go between the people that are joining us here on screen and the people in the room. So if you're in the room, don't feel shy and feel like because you're here, you should only let the people on the screen speak. You'll be able to see them. They'll come up on the screen here. And likewise, if you're on the screen, put your digital hand up or send a message in the chat, and I'll make sure to, to come to you too, because we want to hear from as many people as possible. Um, but I have one of the joys of doing this job is you get sent books in advance. And you can then, because you often get sent two, you get to do what you really shouldn't do, which is scribble in them. And I've had an absolute field day with this book. And so I'm going to start, if I might, Julie, um, by just, this is ridiculous. I haven't worked out how to do this. Whether or not I read it to you, given that you wrote it, is going to sound a little strange. But, but can, I, can I just start with something? Because this, this was one of the first things that really, really struck me. It was just about the, 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 the scale of the arguments within feminism. And you write something right at the start, which actually is quite sort of, but maybe not shocking, but it's pretty vivid, where you say, young women in universities and other settings are being silenced and bullied into accepting a form of feminism that benefits men and is harmful to, to women. You talk about a feminism now where you've seen a greater backlash against the, the, the feminism and the liberation feminism that you speak of than you've seen at any time in decades. And I just want to understand why you think that is. Well, I came to feminism at the very, very end of the 70s, and I was still in my teens, and the women that I met who became my mentors, all of whom were about 15 years older than me on average, so they'd been through the left, they'd been to university in the main, and so I was a bit of a rogue, and semi-feral, I have to say, um, and, and they were focused on male violence towards women and girls, on sexual and domestic violence, on femicide, as we came to call it, and at the time, uh, Peter Sutcliffe, the serial killer, um, was killing women and attacking women with impunity because we had um, a police force at the time in West Yorkshire um, and the rest of uh, the country that cared little about women and that decided that some women were worth more uh, than others, and also a media that reflected that attitude. So at the time, there was a huge backlash towards what feminists were saying which was men rape, 
men commit acts of domestic violence. Women don't just get beaten. Men beat women. Men rape. Yes, not all men. But look at the bystanders and look at the levels of sexual violence. And the backlash was from sexist men, from dinosaur men who'd never even thought uh, that there was a problem with this behaviour, who joked about it, in fact, who normalised it, mm. who said, how dare you, bitch, how dare you talk about men like this? You stay in your lane. But today, we have a situation where there are many men on the left, we'll deal with men on the right later, sure, because trust me when I tell you, I'm no fan of the right. <laughs> uh, so I'm situated very firmly on the left, and we, we have a situation now where I think a lot of so-called progressive leftist men have got so sick of being harangued um, about sexual behaviour, about the entitlement that they feel, issues that Nikki and I will possibly have a bit of a spar on, such as whether it's a right to pay for sex, whether men have a right to sex at all. Um, and I think that the kind of current so-called culture war um, has allowed men who want to say they're on the right side of history to still call us cunts, but actually not use that word. And the liberals are not with us. And this is the difference in the 1980s and 90s, when you saw a men's rights movement that was spiralling and gaining ground, where these men were saying, women do it too, men are the victims of feminism, feminism's gone too far, women should naturally be raising children and be in the home. They were taking custody of our children, they were, they were making real, I mean, difference um, in a bad way to women's lives. The Liberals were with us. They were saying, I know that these feminists are a bit shrill and a bit man-hating sometimes, and they never shave their armpits, but this is not on. Whereas today, somehow they've been convinced that all the things that are bad for women, which we can get to, and again, we'll probably disagree on, um, they're supporting. They love Slut March. They can shout, hey, sluts! when a woman walks past with lipstick across her tits because it doesn't ch challenge or threaten them. So a bit of a long response but, to but your no, answer. No, but Julie, I, I mean, I just want to sort of frame it because I think there's a... Julie's book is really, really... I, I, I take this out as a compliment. is really challenging, right? There are lots and lots of things where you say, OK, I can see the argument for it. In any real world, is that going to happen, right? Pornography, surrogacy, prostitution, the question of men as feminists, corporate feminism. So I'm just putting it out there that people can and should come at this from any uh, any um, angle they want. But let me let me give you just a flavour of it so people see, see see what I mean. There's a there's a there's a there's a line here which is really chastening. If you're someone who's like me, thinks, oh well, actually I'm a feminist. Instead, the book says men can't be feminists, so that itself is a statement. It says, we cannot stand by and pretend that contemporary feminism is about how many women are on the board of the FTSE 100 companies, or about whether a girl of seven who wants to be a boy should be sent to the Tavistock. What are you saying, Julie, that, that feminism has been distracted from its soul or its core priorities? What I'm saying is that we currently have a feminism that benefits more than it does women. That benefits and men more than that women. That benefits men more than it benefits women. So, so mainstream feminism or liberal feminism, um, the kind of sex work is work, porn is empowering, choke, being choked during sex is a choice and we just need to know how to do it safely. Um, the kind of normalization or excusing of um, certain types of religious fundamentalism. Um, I, I think that, you know, we need to ask particularly young women the question, if you actually go along with these kind of mantras, who does it benefit? Who, for example, does it benefit to say, hey, sex work is work, it just pays better than McDonald's? Who is the beneficiary of that? Um, and so the corporate, kind of corporatized feminism is mainly US feminism, but it's also crept in here quite persuasively, where you hear lots of talk about glass ceilings and less, way less, about women in the basement, about women at the bottom. And that's why intersectionality, which has been subverted from its true meaning by some so-called progressives, is the only way that you can understand something like prostitution. Because for all that there are those that say, hey, don't you tell me what to do with my body and, and liken it to the right to have contraception and abortion uh, on demand. 
of course, are not thinking about the majority of those that populate the sex trade and where those women and girls are actually coming from and the backgrounds and the life trajectory that, that they share. So, so can I ask you something? I'm going to come to you, Nikki, in a moment, if I might. Just, just forgive me. I just want to go talk about this, though. Sexual violence, men and sexual violence on the one hand, and then pay representation and power in the economy. And so, without telling tales out of school, I had this argument with Mandu Reid. We went for, uh -huh. for lunch. And at the time, as Mandu running the Women's Equality Party, was saying, as she was going into the mayor, mayoral elections, uh -huh. right, was saying, actually, you know, the thing that we really need to keep focus on is violence against women. Right? That is the central thing. And, and by the way, violence within political circles. This was just after, you remember, that choking event in the Guild Hall or the, uh -huh. uh, you know. So it's like, is it politicians, people in public places are, are visibly acting right. violently towards women, and, and she had then this number of cases. And, and I said to her, well, surely the, the argument around pay, I remember I'd just come out of the BBC, so the arguments around pay were really, you know, powerful and really, you know, energised people. When I read that, I was like, why, why can't you have both things? Why can't you be really a feminist that is driving after liberation in terms of you know sexual violence but also around economics mm -hmm. well of course you can and the equal pay junkies will do that work um you know but isn't, my... that, but isn't that isn't that as much a real feminism as your liberation feminism uh, I, i'm not saying it's not important at all but the, the the problem that we have here if you're looking at what global feminism is and whether it's a movement, and this is why I wrote the book, because I wanted to position feminism again as a movement rather than individual lifestyle choices that some women are making. Or just the idea that any woman can say, well, I'm a feminist, and then in the next sentence, just completely and utterly trash feminism, right? So not all women are paid, but every single woman on the planet and every single girl, and I would say this is the only thing the only thing that unites all women and girls everywhere, there's no other thing, is the fear and reality of male violence. It curtails our lives. And we cannot live as full citizens, and therefore pay becomes a kind of, you know, issue that is very complicated for women if they can't go to work because they've been beaten to fuck. Um, or if they can't go to work and thrive or actually get promoted, not because she's not talented not because she's not worthy of it but because she's being sexually harassed every day but so you're so you're saying julie that the the, the the key thing is it's not that all of those other things aren't feminist but in the hierarchy of issues male violence is the is the is the primary one it's also the only one that unites all women into a global movement That's yeah the I, argument. I, I wouldn't even hierarchy, I, I wouldn't even talk about a hierarchy. For me, obviously, that is my life's work. I think it's the most important issue facing women today. Um, and I'm always happy to hear about other important issues that face women today. Yeah. But I would say, yes, it is the only thing that unites women and girls everywhere. And that has to be our movement. And I would also say that if we were to magically disappear all male violence tomorrow, um, a lot of other things would fall into place. Well, let, 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 let me go. Let me go. To, I, I hope to hear from other people soon, but I want to just make sure that there was a, there was. A, you may have noticed, Nikki, there was a kind of rat a tat tat of things that uh, Julie said in the middle there, which were around porn, around prostitution and sex work, uh, around choking if you do it in such a way that it's consensual. Mm -hmm. What do you say? I, I appreciate there's something slightly synthetic about this argument because I suspect a lot of the stuff that Julie says you totally agree with. But on these particular issues around our sex lives and the culture of sex, what do you say to, to, to Julie's point here, which is all of those things just must be stopped? Porn, prostitution, you know, the sexual culture that we've got. Yeah, well, my point would be, as someone that's been, well, is a former sex worker and has worked around the porn industry and now spends a kind of career writing around sex and relationships and the ramifications of the kind of capitalist system that we have around sex, I feel strongly that we can't believe that sexual performance is inherently sexist towards its participants. And maybe it is in the society and the capitalist system that we have, but I don't think that women should never be able to perform sex, for example. And that, and I mean that in lots of contexts. So I don't so think- So what does perform sex mean? So what I mean is I don't think that people should not, I, I don't think there's anything inherently misogynistic about having sex on screen. 
there might be in the society that we have right now, but I don't think in its base form. I don't think there's no way in which you could have sex on screen that, you know, wouldn't be okay for you to not be harmed by it. So that's where me, Julie, Julie and I differ. I don't think that women having sex on camera with either other women or other men or people of all genders is necessarily detrimental to them. But I do think that the system built around porn tends to be detrimental. But there are lots of feminist pornographers, for example, well, not lots, there's a handful of feminist pornographers trying to create a different kind of content, built in a different kind of business model, different kind of ethical, concern, ethical concerns about the production and the output. And I think they're trying to do something very uh, worthy in trying to kind of switch the model or present a different option for that kind of uh, participation and outcome. So, so Nick, I'm going to try and, uh, as I said, Julie, there's so many things in this book. I'm going to try and do something we don't often do in Thinkings, which is just try and, if you like, segment things. So I'd love to do just 10 minutes on porn and just try and, uh, uh, and eke out the differences here, right? So, because Julie, what, what's your view of that? Is it possible for there to be sex on screen as a form of entertainment that is not by definition in the interest of men and not in the interest of women? Let's end patriarchy and CNN to rape and sexual violence, and then we can talk. So, yes, I think that absolutely. Why would anyone give a damn if you were filming or being filmed for your own erotic pleasure um, in a consensual, completely equal uh, context? But we don't have that. And pornographers, as Nikki has said, um, they're not interested in sex as such, they're interested in profit. And, and this is what drives the porn industry, and it is an industry. And so therefore, um, it's a bit of a different question, I think, maybe Nikki, you'd, you'd disagree, than when we look at men paying for sex, for example. Because what you've just outlined in a kind of utopian world, which I hope we get to one day, is that it's just fun, it's pleasure. It's sexual pleasure that, fantastic, why would we be against that? So therefore, having sex on screen, having sex on camera, yeah, go for it. But, but, but within I'm, this context, you, you, you but, wouldn't have that situation. No, I understand, but I guess what I don't understand truly is, is, so we'll get to the question of men and feminists, but even if you're saying, look, you want to be a male ally to, fe mm. to, to, your, to, to your brand of liberation of feminism, what should be the position on porn? Is it like, we're going to ban porn? What would you like it to I, be? I, I never talk about banning things. But banning things doesn't work. So, but, so what would you like it to be? Well, I would, I would like, um, which is happening, um, that actual progressive people, as opposed to those that masquerade as it, highlight the abuse and the illegality uh, on sites like Pornhub. Right. And look at MindGeek and look at its business model, its true business model. Um, and, and look at the numbers of rapes and um, forms of coercive and harmful sex that are hosted on that site. And I think we need to work towards a world um, where, and this really should be possible for all, us all to imagine, or we really need to ask why it's not possible, where men are not motivated to masturbate two scenes of torture and degradation of women that that becomes separated from sexual pleasure and really scrutinized and so when we hear about banning or censorship or regulation often unfortunately it's put forward by conservative lawmakers yeah. who don't have women's interests at heart so i don't have an i don't really have an answer to this what i want is the scrutiny of the porn industry and the truth to be told about the porn industry Nikki, do you have a view on yeah, so I suppose what I would always think about when Julie and I talk about this or debate about it is there's a generation of women that have viewed content that Julie would think is completely misogynistic and detrimental, and maybe it is, but they've taken something for their own se sexual self-expression from it. And so if we were to say to this generation of women that are maybe they're on OnlyFans or they're camming or they are making a living out of their this output, that everything they do is um, degradation, it's harming them, there's no benefits of them for them and for women in general, ultimately, that they're doing women a disservice. Well, they just don't, they're not, that's not their everyday experience of what they're participating in and the ramifications of it for them. And so if we say, well, that's bad, well, what's the alternative that we're giving them? Because we certainly don't want to say to women, well, all self-expression leads to some kind of misogynistic 
consumption. You know, it's, it's obvious that if women want to be sexual, they should be able to be sexual. But the prism in which often they are participating doesn't make it that possible at the minute, but it doesn't mean that it's not a theoretical possibility. And we should be moving towards, as women, I feel that, you know, being of that generation, being of that ilk of woman, we should be looking towards a future for, well, what, what does that look like and how can we make it in a vision that's going to be positive for women and for everybody, actually. Uh, Nikki, how much do you worry that the sort of modern empowerment feminist that says, look, you know, Feminist, feminists can be pro-porn, pornography can be good for women. That's all just a useful construct for men to indulge the stuff that Julie's talking about that well, is yeah, abusive it's, and violent. It's difficult to know because the women that I know that work in the porn industry who make the feminist porn, people like Erica Lust, for example, who has her own porn studio in Barcelona, you know, it's it's literally her and her vision and she's made that stuff for years and she works with a, a cast there looked after in a certain way. I really don't think you can say to Erica, you're serving the male gaze. I just don't think she is. Now, she doesn't make loads of money out of her enterprise, but what she does do is she sets a standard that other women who want to make that kind of content can ape. And she's, she's very important in showing us that there's another way forward. Now, it isn't receiving capitalist investment. There's a woman called Cindy Gallup, who you might know, who runs some of the comments make love not porn. Julie, I know you know her. She was in advertising and then she said, actually, all the sex I'm having with men feels quite pornographic. I don't like it. So what I'm going to do is set up this enterprise where people submit their own videos of them having sex and then the viewers rate those kind of home videos and it's all done in an ethical way. Now, Cindy isn't able to get investment for that project, but it is, it's got a huge amount of media attention. She and women alike are on this precipice of this understanding and culture that actually that could be a future for this kind of content, or at least half the content we are viewing and consuming could be made in that in that form. So I feel like if we give up on that argument, or you know, if we give up support in that kind of facet, we we're going to really lose the argument. Like Julie says, you can't. She's not against banning it. Neither am I. You can't ban so-called so content that's harmful and also to be fair there are a number of people lots of men in the industry that don't actually want to be part of that you know pa participating in the harm of women they just happen to be because of the capitalist frame around this creation of this content so i'm, I'm gonna ask my colleague alexi mostras to come in here just because well, Alexi, do you want to tell people a little bit about the Mind Geek investigation? Just because I'm interested to know whether or not... Tell people what it did, and then uh, if you can answer the point that both Julie and Nikki are making about, is there a, a different kind of business model, or even regulatory environment, that could answer some of the points that they're both making? Uh, yes, I mean, we, we decided to investigate Mind Geek because uh, there was this sort of fundamental d disparity on the one hand, it operated uh, many of the world's most popular websites, like Pornhub is the sixth most popular website in the whole world. It's in incredibly influential, um, and, and yet it has had almost no scrutiny to it corporately, unlike Facebook or YouTube or all the mo more well-known social media companies, but it's kind of on that level. But yet no one knew uh, who owned it. Uh, its, its spokespeople used uh, fake names. And, and all these quite serious allegations were emerging of um, that, that, that it simply didn't have the systems to, to prevent abuse, quite serious abuse. Um, so we decided to look into it with a specific focus on finding out who owned it, the majority owner of it. Uh, and we, we did, we, we tracked him down and he was, a, he was an Austrian guy called, called Bernd Bergmann and we tracked him down to London and we got to ask him some of the questions that some of the victims had, had wanted answered. And, and that was that was fine, but I mean, it, 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 there is a real, it exposed a real structural problem in the online porn industry because um, there were no, there was, there was huge demand for content, a huge number of viewers, and yet the system that was in place to serve them that content had no control in terms of preventing abuse. So when you saw a video, you didn't know whether the person was over the age of 18. You didn't know whether they were consenting or not. You didn't know if they were verified. You basically knew nothing about them. And it was a hodgepodge of different porn studios tied together in an ecosystem that was incredibly opaque and you couldn't unpick it. And there was a massive, massive potential for abuse, not only kind of the illegal abuse that uh, the, 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 the evangelical associations were focusing on, but very, very kind of worrying algorithmic abuses, if you want to call them that. So for instance, 
there was a massive focus on on choking videos and on on painful sex and um other 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 kind of forms of sex where the the, the presenters could or, or the 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 people in the videos could say that they were consenting it wasn't an illegal act but yet it, 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 there was no regulation or no decision making about what content was being served to to, to the consumers is it, can, I, can I ask you something so the, so the idea of thinking by the way is that it actually drives the journalism something comes out of it so we're in the middle of a process at the moment because luke and alexi write this weekly letter the text date sense maker and one of the things they wrote last week was about the only fans site there's quite an interesting thing, which is the bank steps in and says, look, we're uncomfortable with what is appearing on OnlyFans. Mm. The person who runs OnlyFans then steps back and says, look, we're going to change what we put online. And so we've started ringing around all the banks to say, what, is your, what are your guidelines in terms of investment in porn sites? But what we're struggling to find is what, if you go to the banks and say, what's your guidelines in terms of carbon emissions? Mm. Right? There's, there's a kind of set of scope three rules. Is there, as far as you're both aware, a set of guidelines that you think this would qualify as quote unquote safe, respectful porn? Does such a thing even exist? No. I mean, like if you if you look at America and look at Wells Fargo or some, somebody like that, for example, um, there was a there was a sort of moratorium a couple of years ago around porn performers in California. So some very well known porn performers who were female had their accounts shut down more or less overnight because the banks decided that they were taking a moral position on adult work. Well, of course, it left these women high and dry. It was extremely abusive, I think, actually, and completely picking up the wrong end of the stick. Right. And I think we're seeing it now with sort of social media censorship of people that are uh, either involved in adult work or female bodies, or there's a very kind of cut and dry approach to how we deal with the problem of exploitation in adult content. And what's happening in my, from my perspective and from what I kind of know about the industries that are doing it, is that you've got a, a kind of bank of, let's call them, rich, white, straight men at the top who are making these decisions about women's bodies to get themselves off the hook so they are inscrutable. Mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no actual examination or subtlety in the decision making about who gets policed and who doesn't. And at the same time, nobody is drafting in, there's no liberal drafting in of, well, we decide that people have got a certain right to their body and therefore self-expression self all the rest of it. It's just, we don't want adult content, so we're going to cut all these people out. And mm. it's leaving women high and dry. So, so if I might, I'm going, to, I'm going to bring in Nancy. I don't know, Nancy, whether or not you can hear us okay, but you, I, I just want to, as I said, I mean, we want to cut, cover some other issues, but I just want to get a, your thoughts on porn, because I saw your point about the implications had in the, in the, not on screen, in real lives, in people's relationships. I just wanted to hear what you meant by that. Well, you know, from from my sort of work, I've worked for 10 years supporting parents whose children were sexually exploited. So for me, the kind of shift in the sort of proliferation and easy access of porn and often quite abusive porn for young people has kind of changed, really, the, the sort of climate of sex for young people in that kind of a lot of young boys' first experiences are quite what well, what would probably be quite hardcore porn, and how that is affecting sexual relationships um, for young people, and actually changing the climate of um, of what sex is, which you know yeah. it should be pretty enjoyable. It shouldn't be all kinds of rape and abuse and stuff that kind of is taking power from another person. Um, well, and I think yeah. some of my concern a little bit is that, is I know what interested me about this are the kind of factions and divisions and um, within feminism, but also in kind of a clarity of, um, of a message or something to join us together. And for me, kind of harm, abuse, fairness, people sort of achieving their potential is the kind of uh, main thing for this really it's what should be drawing us together is ensuring that people are safe and free to thrive and we do have to look at our culture when when we're kind of young people young girls are coming to kind of my organization through the parents because they're having you know there's a lot of harmful um, early sexual sexual experiences that are seen as being normalized 
Mm -hmm. uh, Nancy, what is your organisation? Sorry. Um, so I work for the charity Parents Against Child Exploitation. So um, I support parents whose children are sexually exploited through kind of online abuse or through uh, grooming gangs or through child criminal exploitation. Okay, Nancy, thank you very much. If other but, but I, will, I will add this, sorry, I forgot about this, is I think that the challenge is, is that kind of, you know, when people get joy from causing, causing others harm, mm. that, that really to me is the barometer and that's not changing very much for women or children in our society right now. Nancy, thank you. Um, if people in the room have got things to say, please just sort of catch my eye. Oh yes, well, hang on, we were a couple. Listen, there's someone right behind you. Yeah, change is passing over to you. No, do go oh, first. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's a bit of a change of subject. So I don't know if that's okay or that not, is. because you said 10 minutes on Paul, and we've had quite a long time. We, we only know my timekeeping qualities, then you all that. mentioned yeah. before. <laughs> so my question is actually about... What, so what's your name? Uh, Rebecca Rosen, Hello. I'm one of your members. Um, Hello, my question is about what on earth happened to the Me Too movement, which is a big jump from this, yeah. but the, you talked about kind of sexual harassment at work. And it did seem, I mean, obviously it was extreme in the context in which it started, but it did seem like potentially a source of evolution <laughs> about all those situations in which women are harassed in their workplaces, in places of study, in places of entertainment. And there was the glimmer of some transformation there. And it seems to have died a death. And, you know, in, so, in one sense, actually, it seems like the Black Lives Matter campaign, which which emerged in a similar kind of way through social media. So this sudden massive ex explanation has sustained more. And I'm yeah. curious about why it's died such a death after it had such a, you know, a, a loud start and what you think could be done about that. Well, um, I think oh, if, clean. if the only, uh, if your prime oppression is being a woman and people are not that interested in it and i think the me too movement was window dressing um, and i'm not disrespecting at all the actual um founders of that movement because that it actually was founded by an african-american woman who wanted to um, make life better for young sexually exploited girls and for them to have the kind of to, to be encouraged and supported in speaking out. But let's be really clear about it. We had a Me Too movement in the 1960s and 70s. And this was when consciousness raising groups formed all around. Um, I mean, certainly in the, in the global north, much of it, but definitely in parts of the global south, where women said, I was raped where women said, you know, the very first book on child sexual abuse by fathers and other male relatives, um, which was written in the early 1970s, I was sexually abused as a girl, where women started to speak out about the exploitation and abuse that they faced in heterosexual relationships, in marriages, where it was exposed by Cher Height, the sexologist, feminist sexologist, that women were getting a really bad deal in the scratcher that men didn't give a flying fuck about women's sexual pleasure and that they weren't enjoying it and that women were miserable and abused and oppressed and that was the foundation of the women's liberation movement so what the hell are we doing 50 years later saying me too we want him to what about him right yes women have spoken out Yes, we've broken the silence. We broke the silence 50 years ago. Now we need to raise hell. So where's the hell? Why are we still speaking out about our own rapes, about our own abuse? Where, where are the men speaking out about why men are doing this? And that is why I think that Me Too died a death, because it was window dressing. It was yet another just list of women saying i was raped i was raped i am so sick of hearing those stories you know not to disrespect the women who tell their stories they're fabulous we built the movement on that 
But I want something to be done. I want men to be stopped from raping women. And that's it. Me too is, yeah, loads of women. We've all been raped. What of it? What now? I have a question for you about that, but I want that Liz's got something to say. And you say in a second. Um, yeah, thanks, James. Um, well, so no one likes a feminist. I've said that before. Um, men definitely don't like you. Other women who aren't feminists don't like you. And now other feminists don't like you either. It is quite awful being a feminist. <laughs> it's um, a lonely job. It is <laughs> shit. It's really shit. And, and I, I mean, Julie saw all this early. You know, you were young when you, you saw it. And the thing about being a feminist is once you start seeing it, you can't then stop seeing it. It, it kind of snowballs. Uh, I was much, much slower on the uptake. Um, I worked for the first chunk of my career. I was employed in the marketing department of the patriarchy, selling women's magazines, actively making the world worse. Brilliant. And, um, <laughs> and I was in my mid thirties before, it took me getting married to a man and having children for me to start seeing it. Mm. And, um, and so you come, it's a funny, it's, a, it's an odd experience, I think, coming to feminism as a woman it is a gateway job for lesbianism. It certainly was to me, so just be warned. Um, that, 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 and, and that you sort of, if I started at the outside edge, right? So I started with the feeling of I'm pissed off about being talked over in meetings and passed over for, prom for promotion and, you know, um, being underpaid relative to my male peers. I started there. And it's a bit the nice, shiny feminism where you kind of sit in the Albright Club and you light a scented candle and you empower each other to have a startup, <laughs> design a swimwear business. And, I, and now I'm as pissed off about that kind of feminism as I was part of it in the beginning. But, uh, but, but what Julie's book is, um, and that's my copy with the orange post-it notes stuck mm -hmm. all on the pages, is it's very, it's very clarifying and it's very energizing. Um, as a because it is shit being a feminist and it's very easy to give up because I felt when I was reading Julie's book I did laugh that there's, there's funny bits in it and um, I also genuinely cried twice um, probably not the bits that I was meant to cry at other bits but um, I, I winced a bit some, some of it and I but I also was embarrassed I was embarrassed for the kind of feminist I have been and, and times in my life. But look at me, I'm a well-educated, white, able-bodied, middle-class, whatever the things are, I am a feminist. I need to be useful. I want to be useful. I know I need to be braver if, I, if I'm up to it. I don't know if I am. And what Nancy said, I think really resonated, which is I thought to myself, after all the types of things I've thought were the thing that you're meant to do if you're a feminist, mm -hmm. most of which aren't really the things that you're meant to do if you're a feminist, um, I thought to myself, actually, violence against women and girls is the thing. That is the thing that you could safely do as a feminist that no one's going to have a go at you about. But guess what? That is wrong as well. Because as soon as you go for violence against women and girls, you get into single sex spaces and refuges, and you get into carceral feminism, which Julie talks about in the book, which is the radical belief that men who commit violent crime should be in prison apparently it's not okay so so there's nowhere you can do feminism properly where people aren't going to hate you and that is a real problem for the movement okay, I, okay. Think. Well, can I, can I ask you okay, I'm, I, I, I do want to put, put something in here which is just to say and there are two people in the room and there are a number who've got you three I'm gonna come. but just for a moment I just want to say there is a, there is a there was a moment Julie you may not remember about a couple of years ago we held a festival right and and one of the debates was along similar lines. And I was sitting in the back corner, and I think you, you, someone asked, do you think there's been progress for women in the last 30 years? And I sort of, you know, literally put my hand up. You could see the whole room turn around going, are oh, you so heroically <laughs> out of touch, right? But just, but just for a moment, let's just point out something, which is there is, a, there is a problem here, which is if you say as a man you're a feminist, Right, or you see progress in this side, then either it looks as though you're a sort of unwitting defender of the patriarchy, or it can look very performative, or as I say, you, you can look as though you just don't really understand the depths and the, the fissures all you talk about. But actually, the fact that we're having this conversation, there's an understanding of all of these different gradations of uh, feminism. I should be perfectly honest, I love my dad, I really do, but generationally, right, he wasn't in tune with this. And so the conversation that you were talking about in the 60s and 70s, right, that was a radical fringe conversation. It may be that we are, we have a, 
a, a movement that kind of slipped onto Twitter and then sort of drifted away in terms of Me Too. But, but the extent to which there is there is a, a general understanding, certainly even in newsrooms, in mainstream newsrooms mm -hmm. now, that we have a massive problem in our criminal justice system, in our justice system, right? That, you know, the thing at the beginning of the book about 1.4% rape convictions, that's a mainstream set of ideas. Things are changing, mm -hmm. things are moving. So I don't think that, you know, I don't feel, I don't feel, I mean, and that's the problem, I probably, <laughs> There's maybe a reason for that. Okay, I'm going to come to you, sir, and then you, Madam, in a second, and then you behind, so, yeah. It, it, just a, a kind of timely intervention, what I was going to say anyway, but um, I think... You know, so I'm sorry, because you came before, and I forgot your name. Uh, my name's Peter Marshall, Peter, hello, nice um, and I, okay. I work in uh, compliance, which means I'm responsible for the company that I work for in making sure that we comply with all of our laws and that we don't lose our reputation because we've been doing terrible things. But the company that I work for is a hotel company. Uh, one of the things that I have been really stressed about in the last couple of weeks is because investors now have organizations that find out about companies that are listed on the stock exchange and the things that they do in order for example to help with the climate crisis you know the things that everybody now understands are the urgent challenges threatening our world and one of the things that i've been really stressed out about is our board diversity policy and its implementation because our board is not 50 50 equal but I work for a hotel company, and what I care about is not the fact that uh, we've only got one woman uh, as a non-executive director on our board. I care about the fact that hotels are an incredibly uh, high risk point, a vector for sexual yeah. violence against women and girls. Um, but capitalism doesn't enable me to do that, right? So you're right to say there has been progress because my job didn't exist. It didn't used to exist. Right. There used to be no one in an organization caring about women and women, you know, women's position within the organization, how we support the lowest paid women within an organization, because they are all women who are the lowest paid, they are our cleaners, you know, there didn't used to be anyone doing that. And now there is, and that's great. But the focus is very middle class. It's not on the fact that the highest growing industries in this world are exploitation of labor through modern slavery and sex trafficking of women. Yeah. And those are the things that I have to try and prevent. And I have a legal background. So I know how to do a corporate board report. I don't necessarily know how to make a hotel a safe space for young women and girls who are being brought in there without their consent. But is, and and that's that's the situation that I'm talking about. But isn't but like, aren't we aren't we dealing here, Julie? Because just I'm going to come to you in a moment, uh, and then you might say, but aren't we dealing with actually quite an exciting thing in terms of what's happening in feminism? It's it's it. You know, we've sort of titled this thing as a fight for feminism, and I, and and Liz and I went backwards and forwards about sides in this, and actually. We're dealing with complexity. In our newsroom, I would agree with you, Julie, against some of my colleagues on, for example, on a bunch of trans issues, on gender and sex, right? They will passionately disagree with us on that. Yeah. I would feel, I feel uncomfortable about some of the things you say about sort of pushing men out of a position of being feminist. Mm -hmm. I think actually it's a good idea for men to be able to stand up and be feminist. Are we dealing with the reality that this is this is we're much more aware and as a result we're much more aware of kind of competing interests here well first of all i definitely didn't hear liz say that feminism um is hasn't achieved anything <laughs> i think feminism has achieved huge amounts and actually the feminism that has really progressed the world is the anti-male violence feminism changing laws minds legislation implementing that at the moment we're in a, a very difficult position with things sliding back because of the cps um and uh, and the way that the criminal justice system is is not fit for purpose, but we've achieved huge amounts. Um, the thing about uh, men uh, and feminism is people often under misunderstand what I mean by this. I don't mean we don't want men to do things. We absolutely do, but we don't think it's all right for men to just declare themselves feminism feminists. Feminism is the only political movement on the planet that centres women and girls, and when you have men identifying and labeling themselves as feminists as opposed to supporters of feminist feminism or anti-sexist men that actively do things you have male leaders on podiums at conferences being clapped and hailed as oh isn't he wonderful because he's not an <laughs> arsehole no no i know i know that i know that i know, that. I know that. <laughs> By the way, just in that interest, I should just say the paragraph on Richard Branson is particularly good in this area. <laughs> so, but, but, Julie, but my question is, is, is feminism good news for men? Absolutely it is. Feminism is the most optimistic so why would you not on then, the planet. So then why would you not be comfortable having men saying we're feminists? In the same way that I don't call myself um, a black civil rights leader or, or um, a no, black anti-racist... I don't call myself an anti-racist activist. I say that 
because uh, I'm not, I'm not an anti-racist activist. Um, you know, I want to be not racist and I want to be actively anti-racist in my behavior, my belief system and my actions. But I'm not going to go into other people's movements and just declare myself part of that movement. I'm going to say it's right and proper that I support that movement. Now, you absolutely would not get um, white people at a Black Lives Matter rally going on about, you know, their own central role in that movement. You just wouldn't. They'd be kicked out of town. <laughs> and so why is it all right for men to just put a T-shirt on and look like a set of proper dickheads and say, <laughs> you know, this is what a feminist looks like. No, David Cameron. No, <laughs> this is really not what a feminist That's looks really, like. That, I'm, I'm gonna, there's, there's someone here, sorry. Can you say so, your name? My Hi. name's Claire, um, and I agree on the violence point being a uniting factor. Um, but I wonder if it's scary for, for girls to hear about this. And I say this as my daughter identifies as a boy, a teenage daughter started at puberty and you know she suffered uh, misogynist and homophobic bullying in primary school and then secondary school. And um, around the similar time, I faced misogyny at work. I was talking about it at home. So she just thinks I wanna opt out which makes perfect sense. And then you also, yeah, your popularity, it's really good for your popularity at school. Um, so how can we help her? How can we address this important topic, but not scare um, children and younger women away? And I remember myself, my mother loved Gloria Steinem, had Ms. Magazine, and I didn't understand really because my father is a really nice guy and wasn't doing any of these bad things that my mother talked about when discussing feminism. So it put me off and I've come to it really late like Liz because of personal experience. And, and can I just ask my, you, so, so what, what, I didn't hear your name when you- My name is Claire. Claire. And Claire, how do you square that because uh, I, you know, we haven't talked, we deliberately didn't get into the argument between about feminism and trans, and, and yet it'd be strange not to have that conversation. How do you square it? How do you think about feminism and your daughter and the arguments that are obviously taking place, and Julie's obviously a big part of those, those arguments. How, how do you think about that? Is there a way of having a, uh, a feminism that is supportive of your daughter, of, trans women, do you see that, that that works or is it inevitably going to be the kind of conflicts we've seen recently? I mean, I don't know and I don't want to drag this whole event yeah. in that direction. Um, I'm just curious on the violence um, aspect and how do we show girls that feminism is not all about that? How do we okay. make it a welcoming place that's not scary while, while acknowledging that there is this really, you know, big issue, which is violence. And I agree on that. I'd love to hear what Nikki has to say about this, but just briefly, um, by the time I was nine, I'd already been flashed up by some bloke in the park. I'd witnessed domestic violence. Um, I'd been curtailed um, because of the fear of, um, of men's sexual violence. So that's a, that's a girl's experience. And Hadley Freeman at my book launch last night, the Guardian journalist, who's absolutely brilliant, spoke about opting out of girlhood through anorexia. So she starved herself for years and was in hospital for four years and very, very seriously ill. And she speaks brilliantly about that. And now there is another opportunity for girls opting out of girlhood because girlhood shit. But just to answer your question about um, how do we not frighten these girls? There's a whole chapter in my book about, you know, dispelling the myth about how feminists are the ones that frighten uh, other women by going on about male violence. Unfortunately, your daughter will already understand that. So feminism can give her an opportunity to feel courageous, supported, and that she can be part of a movement or at least have the benefits of a movement, which is feminism, that will seek to end the shit that girls go through. So I think it's the opposite of scaring girls. You, and there's a way of doing it that isn't about, if you go out, you're going to be raped, which is what your mum used to say to you, mm -hmm. right? And what we're saying is, we will stop these men from raping. Nikki, 
what's your answer to Claire? Yeah, so I mean, I don't have children, I'll say that first of all, so I don't know what it's like to be a parent, but I do know what it's like to be a child, obviously. And I suppose when I was growing up, there was a lot of male violence in the vicinity, not in my family, but in the vicinity of where I lived. And I grew up in a very small working class town where it was pretty rough and ready. And, you know, you couldn't go into certain areas of the pub because there were big gangs of men and all that kind of thing that we, you know, we were all kind of brought up with at that time. But I suppose in my family, which was very strongly feminist without putting the F word on it, they didn't, it wasn't a word that anybody would have used. The feeling was always that this is how we'll teach you to be safe like Julie says, to be courageous, to be strong, to know your own mind, to know when people are crossing your boundaries. So bodily autonomy is like a really important thing that you can teach a child, right? And, and then the ability to trust somebody, and it doesn't matter who that person is, but at least one adult who has got your back. So I was very lucky as a child. I had trust in both my parents, and my dad was a, a particularly good role model for me in terms of being someone that, not a role model, but being a, um, a good ally for me and being someone that I could trust to tell things to and wasn't a particular macho man. So I, was, I always felt very lucky. You know, I'd go to the people's houses and see the mum making the tea and everybody getting a bit stressed and the dad comes home from work and stuff like that. And I didn't grow up in that house. My dad was an art teacher. He was home first. He sorted me out. My mum worked late. I didn't know anything about that. But my point being that I think those positive things of like, how do you stay safe? How do you know when someone's crossing your boundary? How do you know when someone's encroaching on your autonomy i think all children can be taught that to a varying degree and i know that in education now increasingly we teach children that from like the age of four like if someone touches you or approaches you to touch you you don't let them do certain things or you tell someone so like i say, i'm not a parent but the only from from talking to people that work in education from talking to people that work with young people what seems to work with girls is a sense of you are you know brilliant and you should be allowed to do certain things in the world and you should not feel fear about moving through the world mm -hmm. and then later on a conversation about well that would be if you do that then maybe there's a repercussion of x can come about but i don't in general i don't even think in feminism we talk about don't do that because you might get raped anymore yeah, i think everyone's yeah. moved i think it was yeah. moved on from that so. there's actually actually nikki just as you were speaking there rosalind singleton who wrote in the chat i agree i also think young girls see things and are aware and it's less frightening to actually talk about the fact that stuff isn't her fault even when very young yeah, they have right. to put up with so much and very crap. very important because mm -hmm. people shake sh people give you their shame without them realizing it mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Nikki, can I, yeah, I'm forgive me for interrupting. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I brought in a couple of people who are not in the room. But Yasmin, um, first, it's very nice to see you. But you made a number of points around these the labels, the way we talk about ourselves and each other. Hi, James. Yeah, I just think I've personally become less and less interested in in what we call people and what people call themselves because it's much more instructive to look at what people do. Right. And I think there's so much focus on the semantics. It's become almost like an aesthetic. And you can argue about, you can talk about Instagram feminism. You can talk about whether men should or shouldn't call themselves a feminist. I, for example, know that many women in the Muslim community run the complete opposite way when you mention the word feminist, but their actions are, and if you want to talk about not being liked um, when it comes to gender equality and so on, sort of you put Muslim and feminists in the same circle, the same space, and everyone's pissed off. But I think it's much more instructive to look at what are people fighting for and what are they actually doing? How are they using their power? How are they organizing? Um, what are they doing in their day-to-day -day lives? How are they treating people in their families and so on? Because what happens is people call themselves a feminist or they run, they're the CEO of Time's Up, and then their son ends up getting accused of sexual assault. And it's like, What's the point of all these labels if they're constantly being eroded, if they're constantly not mm -hmm. being used? I frankly don't care. I frankly just want to see you do things. Yeah. So, Yasmin, Yasmin thank you. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to do one thing just at the end. We very deliberately didn't start this around the arguments from trans, right? but it would be a, an oddity, as I said, not to do it. And I appreciate, Claire, you weren't trying to drag the conversation in that direction either. But, but, but and I understand, but, but forgive me, but. It's, it is a real argument in our newsroom. We are really divided and we have different points of view and it would be odd not to just address it. So I just want to read a section from your book, Julie. Mm -hmm. and I just want to ask the people in the room whether they agree or disagree with this, right? So Julie writes, at the same time, women are under pressure to deny the biological reality of our bodies and to use terms such as chest feeding for breastfeeding and front hole for vagina. Even the term woman is in danger of becoming obliterated in favor of menstruator, womb haver, and non-man. And then goes on to the, the 
uh, to the point I made earlier about young women in universities and other settings being silenced and bullied. Who here agrees with that concern that Julie is voicing? Right, please, please do, yeah, raise your hands if you agree with that concern that Julie's voicing. Feel free to put your hands up so I can see them all and so that people at home can see. And who here disagrees? Feel free to put your hand right up. There it goes, there it disagrees. Now, can I make a point, right? These, the, the, could, could you, could those people who disagree, put your hands up. Put your hands up. So Julie, what's going on here? Because these are my colleagues, right? And they're all, all in their 20s. Mm -hmm. So what's happening to the, your feminism that is fundamentally at odds with a new generation of extremely, you know, committed progressive people? Mm. Um, I was really delighted at my book launch last night to sign um, well over 100 books uh, for women in their 20s or younger. And I get contacted all the time by young women, um, I mean weekly, who say things like, um, we want to talk about this because we're not against trans people at all, but we are concerned about the way that it's being used by some um, that hold extreme, so, so the extreme transgender ideology. So if we can actually look at what the question really is, this isn't about whether or not we want to include trans people and fight for the liberation of trans people to live as they wish. This is about the backlash against women when we speak about particular issues that are pertinent to us. And I'm the opposite of a biological determinist. I mean, I, I want to get rid of, of, of gender. Uh, that has to be the feminist project. Um, I have no idea what it feels like to be a woman. None at all. I just know what it feels like in relation to being treated um, by men in particular ways. <laughs> so, so I think that what people often confuse is, because obviously the whole narrative is, they're just transphobic feminists. She's a transphobe. She hates trans people. If you say something as Chimamanda did, which is trans women are trans women, and I will fight for their liberation. So if you don't go to the extreme of, well, trans women are literally women, then it's so easy for the slur of transphobe. And when, um, when I have uh, questioned young people that have been very kind to get up early in the morning to come and pick at me at certain <laughs> events <clears throat> for a nice warm welcome, and I say, please, let's have a conversation. What is it I've said that offends you? Um, most of the time, they've never read a word I've ever written. And, and I think that this conversation has to be, um, it has to be a debate. It can't be a silencing of one side of the argument because it's supposed to be hate speech. It isn't. But, they, but I don't know whether or not Phoebe or Patricia or Laura wants to weigh in, but actually, in my... Or, or Claire, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, there's Phoebe. Because I, I think Phoebe has read a lot of what you've written. <laughs> I have read what you've written. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and I make an effort to read around, I think, in the same way that, um, you know, I think anything that you, you kind of get involved with mentally, and, and this is something that I do get involved with, is that you should read as much as you should and you should take both sides and, and be aware of it. I think where it becomes really hard for me is, and I, and I know that the personal shouldn't affect me. Journalism is what I love and I know I shouldn't do that, but I have a friend who has just come out as trans and I have really, really struggled to see, and it's not you, it's other people who have taken this, idea of trans people and turn it into something vicious and i have seen them be verbally abused in the street and that's not something that i and, and i and i just i really struggle with it and, and where it comes from is this idea that they are not a woman and that that's hard for me to see and i then i get like messed up in my personal side and i understand the wider viewpoint and we can talk about ideology but this is quite a safe space and they are not in a safe space mm -hmm. so that's where i find it really hard when we start talking about safe spaces for women because that is, those arguments are then making it unsafe for trans women and then you get into real messy situations so i don't have an answer is what i'd say but i do think that 
that you have to you have to do you have to think about the implications of debate in a very safe academic space absolutely i agree and it's not feminists that are abusing and attacking trans people in the street we are allies mm. because especially for lesbians the clubs i went to as a young woman was full of people who were beyond gender variant let's face it there's nothing more gender non-conforming than a lesbian feminist right so i've grown up with this and i i absolutely get the issue the problem is that um that sex-based rights that were fought for before people in their 20s were born and none of us can help that were absolutely instrumental in giving the freedoms to women and gender non-conforming people and to see that there is a risk that they will be taken away from us is abhorrent and there has to be a way in which trans people as a group of oppressed and marginalized people can do what what women in the anti-violence against women movement did in the early days which was build refuges mm. build rape crisis centers from scratch with no money and we would support trans women in doing that but there is a clash of rights and we have to be honest that there is a clash of rights yeah. here Julie, I just want to bring in Chris Cregan, if I might. Um, Chris, are you there? Will you just unmute yourself? Yeah, sorry, no, I'm here, right. yeah. I, I, I mean, we've possibly moved on. I, I wanted to say something about the labels issue, but um, I'm yeah, happy go, go, to... go, go ahead, we're going to go ahead. Please do. I, mean, I guess in a way, it's, it's, it's just briefly, it's just it's interesting to do so in the, in the context of what we've just been talking about. Um, and I'm probably not on the same page. Well, I'm definitely not on the same page as as as, as Julie on on some of the issues around trans rights. But I, I definitely am on the same page as her in relation to a whole host of other things around sex, so-called work and pornography and so on. And Julie, I've been reading you for for many years. Um, I, 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 on this labels thing, I, I don't think it is a matter of semantics. Um, you know, as a gay man, I've been around. Um, uh, feminist politics um, since I was at university 40 years ago, um, influenced very heavily by radical feminists involved in the Trouble and Strife Collective back in the early 80s. I've never called myself a feminist. Uh, I'm never going to, I'm never going to wear a t-shirt. I just think, you know, we don't, as men, we don't have to appropriate and own everything. <laughs> Um, we can we can we can be supporters, um, you know, for, for goodness sake. Um, and I think there's a real problem with, you know, you put on the T-shirt or you do whatever you do, you position yourself in a way that somehow excludes yourself from the problem. Um, and if the biggest problem is male violence, and, and I think it is, and it's huge and it's pervasive and it's global, um, then somehow, you know, when you say you're a feminist, actually, you're kind of you're kind of letting yourself off the hook. You know, you're somehow saying you're not part of the problem. And, you know, for as long as patriarchy exists, um, and sadly that seems to be a long way into the future, all men are part of the problem. You know, all men, absolutely all men are potentially part of the problem at any time. And so I don't think it is just a matter of semantics because I think, I think what you're doing when you're saying you're a feminist is somehow you're, you're kind of defining your role and your place and your agency in the world in, in, in a way that just isn't appropriate. Chris, thank you. Um, I, I, I say thank you. Um, I would love to have that conversation. I really don't agree. <laughs> um, I really don't agree because if you believe that, that feminism is a good outcome for men, and if you believe that the end of the patriarchy is a good outcome for men, then it surely does matter where you stand on this. And I don't think that is an appropriation. I think that's an engagement with the issue. So I, I don't agree, but I think it's really, I feel like, oh my God, that's a whole kind of breakout <laughs> room. I want to just bring, if I might, just Katie John went in. If it, it, Katie, are you there? Because you said the thing that I absolutely loved, which is I agree and I disagree. It's, sort of summarizes my position on the whole thing. And my cat wants to speak as well. But, um, <laughs> no, and I did not put my hand up to speak. I just threw it in the chat because I didn't want to deal, derail this in any way at all either. But I, I am the kind of person who likes to engage outside my echo chambers completely. Um, I live two doors down from Linda Bellos. So Julie will imagine the interesting conversations I have with Linda. <laughs> over the but, but, but Linda and I have been friends for 15 years. Um, Julie and I both spoke at separate panels at the Women of the World Festival last year. 
So, you know, an example of something like that, that, that Jude Kelly runs, the Women of the World Festival, is a place where um, the, 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 there's a broad definition of women and allies and men in the sense that they're all welcome and included at a festival like that. And, and I think there was an interesting term that Julie actually did use there. And I have also read a lot of Julie's works and went to the, um, oh, the, the, the Helen's panel on difficult women at Women of the World last year as well. Um, but what, um, what comes to me around this is the fact that Julie used the term gender non-conforming people oh. as one of the phrases she just dropped in about five minutes ago. And I thought, well, hold on, GNC people is another label, I know. But it used the word people. And for, for many people, they have a very strong identity with man or woman. And absolutely, that's what they should run with in life. And there are other people who don't have a strong identity with yeah. agenda. And using the word people to me is a very good label solution for that one. And it, and it gets around this kind of um, whole argument that there's a kind of an occupying of other people's language and labels. And this is where we come to when there's the, that was read out of Julie's book around the, the language. Let's like reinterpret all the language to be inclusive around people who bear children rather than actually calling them mothers and women, which I have absolutely no problem with. So to me, I prefer additive terminology rather than replacement terminology, okay. you know, trying to find, you know, um, wording that is inclusive rather than um, replacement or exclusive. And then you can easily, very easily go to um, a refuge shelter that is inclusive and there'll be some that are exclusive. And I'm OK with inclusive and exclusive language because it gives you a very good understanding of whether you would be welcome there or not. So I don't believe in it, in taking something that already exists in that sense. And I know that and I quite like the phrase um, that, that don't, don't use the word woman because it's been taken. And I'm OK with that language. But that also gets me kicked out a lot of trans circles for even voicing <laughs> an opinion. <laughs> exactly. So I, I get my ass kicked from both sides. Um, <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah. Katie, thank, you for, thank you very much. Um, there, I, I, Part of the joy of actually getting back together is that we're back together, we get the chance to do this. It, it is actually, this is the second time that we've actually had a thinking where we're both in the room and online. And uh, as you can see, we're struggling, but mostly because it's such a pleasure to be able to see people and talk to them, but also then hear people who couldn't make it and join mm. us. That's a very long-winded way of saying, <laughs> I'm 10 minutes over. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry that I've run a little bit over. At the end of a thinking, as you, if you've been to them before, it's the job of the editor to pull it all together and say, this is what this all means. Feels to me that probably in the better interests of hastening the end of the patriarchy, I don't do that on this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna leave everyone to continue this conversation. There is one other thing you can do other than kind of weigh into the discussion with Nikki and with, uh, and with Julie you can also pick up a copy of uh, Julie's book. Um, so if you do want to, Julie will sign. One thing to say, if you're at home and you would like a signed copy of Julie's book, please message me and I will make sure that that message reaches uh, Julie so she can sign a copy of uh, her book for you as well. Um, on that note, uh, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming here. It really does mean a lot to us to get the newsroom back and alive and hearing from our members. Uh, a big thank you to you, uh, Nikki. A massive thank you to you, Julie. Thanks to everyone who's joined us online. Just to let you know, we dealt with probably, yeah, I think we dealt with two out of the eight questions that I had. So I think we did better than usual. Not bad. Okay, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks so much.